Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. What a blessing. Hope you were, uh, your soul was edified, lifting your praises to our God and singing those words to Him. And now we're going to continue our worship through the Word of God proclaimed. Um, what, a, what a blessing. Uh, this morning we're going to continue in the book of Romans. So if you will turn to chapter 8, the Mount Everest of this epistle, my heart has been overcome. And this morning, we're going to look at one of the most important prepositional phrases in the Bible. My favorite probably is in Christ. And this morning, we're going to look at by the Spirit. Uh, I've kind of given my life to try to understand this phrase, this prepositional phrase. And I, I know it in a mirror dimly, but uh, insight into it is just jumping off the pages of Scripture, what I want to share with you this morning, uh, resulting in putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the transformation that I desire so badly, and, and I pray that you desire Christ to be formed uh, in you by the Spirit. So let's go to our God, the only one who can change and transform us, and ask Him to do that very thing in our midst. Father, we come before you, and we thank you for a gospel that has torn a veil in two, and has given us full access now as children into your favor and help and presence. God, we thank you that we approach as children. God, we've been adopted into your family, and we have all of the blessings that come in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, as we begin, we're just unfolding those in Romans 8. I pray this morning, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to understand this passage. Teach us how to live it out. God, we desire conformity to Christ. As Greg read this morning, our hearts want to walk in righteousness. We want to walk as Jesus walked on this earth. He modeled and showed what it looks like as a perfect son of God to live for his father. And so God, we, we want to be those people and we acknowledge our need and our dependence. And we look to you and ask that you would do that in us and that you would meet us this morning in our worship. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, I love what's possible for those who have been called by God. This whole chapter has been framed by verse 4 for me so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. It's a henna clause in the Greek, and it's the purpose for why there's no condemnation, why he set us free from the bondage of sin is so that we could keep the fulfillment of the law to love God and to love others. And the, the light and impact that we can make on this dark, self-centered, unloving world is beautiful. To be a city set on a hill, set on a lampstand shining into the darkness of this world. Where we're not just those that have a set of doctrines and we try to live a certain way. We're those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. And now we are according to the Spirit who can now walk in love for the first time. We have true agape that comes from God and goes out toward him and others. It's a, a love that sacrifices for our king, our God. It dies to self and it serves other people. It's a love that is just so foreign to this earth. It's from heaven and it's what God desires from his, from his children. Hinnaclaus, this is what he wants. This is why he's died for you. His glory will come through us loving like no other. We're currently looking at what fights against this new desire and power that resides within us. We are new creations, but we have what's called sarks, flesh that still remains. It doesn't rain, but it remains in every child of God. We have met the enemy and it's us. I have a traitor within. It fights against my new desires and my new thoughts and my hopes to try to make me earthly, to try to make me fleshly and live for the scene and these lusts and desires. So many just want to fight the battle outside of us. But the true battle for the Christian is on the inside. It's in our own bodies and minds and desires that we must fight. And so to battle these desires within, God has sent his own spirit within us. And now he dwells in us. Not this Old Testament where the Spirit came and left. He now takes up residence within every believer. The Spirit of God dwells within us. And he is the sovereign one now ruling over us. We're under his jurisdiction. Uh, the Spirit then is causing us to hate sin because he hates sin. The Holy Spirit gives us holy desires. 
from within. From our very core, our heart, our mission control center hates sin and loves God. That's the new covenant. I'll put it within your heart. That's what God has done in giving us these new hearts and making us new. Yet there's remaining sin within. And we're in the battle for our souls. And we're going to learn as much as we can so that we can be victorious and put to death the deeds of our body, of our flesh. John Owen, the great Puritan, said, we must be killing sin or sin will be killing us. Uh, summary, kill or, or be killed against this remaining sin that's still within every one of us. And so I've been praying that God would stir Southside Bible Church in every way to hate the sin and to be in a corporate war together against it, to put it to death. I'm just tired of American Christianity that lets this stuff stay and remain and give it new names, give it excuses. Uh, it's time to put it to death by the Spirit of God. Father, I pray Awaken us to this battle. God, if we become lazy and meandering, indulging, whatever be the case of every soul here this morning, I pray, God, set us free by this gospel. New beginnings. You love prodigals who turn back and say, life is not away from the Father, but life is the Father. God, let every soul turn back to their God and engage by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Let us not spare sin and coddle it and pet it. God, work in your midst and do what only you can do among your people. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The outline, outline from last week as we pull it up is Romans 8, 12 through 13. Paul's giving us five elements that we must understand to have victory over our sin as believers. And we looked at the beginning, the foundation is so then. Uh, all of this is built on what God has already done in Christ. We're, we're accepted by Him. There's no more condemnation. He loves us. The, the whole battle begins with, with that foundation. And so that's our foundation. Our second point was the audience, which is brethren. This is for the believers. You don't fight sin to become a believer. You fight sin because you are a believer. And then we began looking at our duty last week, and our duty is to put to death the deeds of the flesh, that, that word uh, mortify, to, to put in the morgue, to, to kill sin, to put it to death. And we have learned what this means. We all have it. It's in every one of our lives. We have to fight it. Our pride, jealousy, gluttony, worldliness, approval, securities, fear, anxiety, wrong thoughts on sex, it's outworkings, gossip, anger, a million ways that remaining sin wants to express itself against God and against other people to keep you from what you've really been made for, to, to love God and to love other people. We've been made to, to fulfill that, to live into it as children of God. You've been joined to Jesus Christ in Romans 6 by baptism, a spiritual baptism, and you were raised to walk in newness of life. And the mark of this is love to him. And that gives you a hatred for sin. You cannot love what God hates. And so when you are made alive and you love God, you now are an enemy to what he's an enemy to. And we're an enemy against sin. And if you hate it, you will make war with it. That's been your life since you believed. Since you've been born again, I pray you must have entered into a battle against sin. And our flesh won't quit until Romans 7, 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's going to be a deliverance from this one day when Christ returns or we breathe our last. But last week, what we began looking at is in the Christian church, we fight the flower of sin. And we're masters at just trying to, to work out the, the, the flower of what you're doing. Your sin is, I got angry. And, and so what, what you can usually do to fight the flower of sin is self-effort. That all over the world, we have moralism, we have 12 steps, we have a lot of ways to, to fight the flower of sin, but never get to its root. And so they just grow back in different ways, bigger ways, more blossomed. And what we're going to learn in Romans 8 is the mortification of sin as we go to the root. We go to the heart. We go to what our idols are, what, what are our, our things we worship, the things of the heart. And the only way you can put those to death is by the Spirit of God. You can lop off flowers by flesh, 
but you can't put to death sin and its roots except by the Spirit of God. And that is where this battle must be fought. And that's what we're learning as a church. How do we do that? It can't be spared. My dad used to tell me before basketball games, he was my coach, son, take no prisoners. <coughs> take no prisoners in this war. Have you ever went all out after a sin and would accept nothing but its death or annihilation? I wonder how many could say, I've done that. I will not accept anything but its death and annihilation from my life. Or do you just fight it? Kind of hoping in the back of your mind you'll fail. Or maybe I'm at peace with failing. Or maybe you've come to just expect it. While you house the Holy Spirit of God within you. So here is your command and here is your marching orders in Christ Jesus. But here's where it gets so hard. Is I, I can't kill any sin in my life. I've already learned that in Romans 7, uh, in my flesh, I can do nothing good. In me dwells no good thing that is in my flesh. I've tried, pastor, for decades to kill sin, and I've absolutely gotten nowhere. I sit here this morning, I'm discouraged, and I'm depressed, and I wonder if I'm a Christian at all with how poorly I have done at this, and I, I want to bless your weary soul this morning in the Word of God. And so what I want today is to tackle how do we do an impossible command if it were up to me to do it? How, you know, if, if it, we didn't have this little prepositional phrase, you know, it'd be like, flap your arms and fly to the moon. And just like, that's not very encouraging. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. I've tried that, Pastor. By the Spirit. It gives life to this command. I have divine resources dwelling within me who desires and can empower me to put to death the deeds of the flesh, and by the Spirit. There are the most hope-giving words that I've ever heard. By the Spirit. And this gives wings and hopes to this command to mortify sin. So much killing of sin is fought in our own strength trying to do this command. And it's God's goodness and design that He won't allow for that. He's not going to let you get it done in your own strength so you get all the glory and can pat yourself on the back. That's not how it's ever going to work. It's to humble you so that it will lead you to Christ and by the Spirit how to get this victory. So it is a gift that you're not winning this battle in your own strength. Well, how does it work? How do I do it? Do I do it? Does he do it? And the answer this morning is yes. Yes, and I pray we'll understand that by the end of our sermon. So let's take a look at our fourth point in our outline the means that God does the mortification of sin. And by the Spirit, next week, we're going to look at the promises in this passage that the one who does this will have life, it's eternal life, and the one who lets sin rule and reign, uh, death, which is eternal death. And now we've got to look at that and understand how that ties in with justification by faith in Christ alone, and we will try to understand that next week. So the, by the Spirit, what does that mean? I'd love to, I wish it was a Bible study. I want to hear from you guys. What does that mean by his spirit? My first thought <clears throat> is that Paul never just throws things out there that are really consequential without teaching us what it means, right? He's never, he wouldn't just drop by the spirit. It's that big and not teach us what it means. I hope you can figure out what that means. So there's no way we're just left to wonder what this means. To come up with all kinds of stuff. As I was studying, there are, there are sayings. Uh, you can make this be whatever you want by the Spirit. I read more things about it, and none of them come from this context. The Spirit is not just something we take hold of like a sword, and now let's go stab at sin. But it's someone who takes hold of us, and we are now under obligation to Him, and He will mortify sin in our bodies. So here's my simple idea this morning. Context is where we're going to find where Paul, what Paul's talking about. And one thing for sure is Romans chapter 8 is brimming with the Spirit. He hasn't been brought up in Paul's whole letter except in the introduction. And we're, we're going to find so much in this chapter on the Holy Spirit that if we just stay in it, we're going to learn what it means to put to death by the Spirit. So come journey with me this morning. And I apologize that this is not a 10-minute sermon with pictures. This is going to take work, hard work to set your mind on the things through the Spirit of God. So it just, you got to work 
this morning. Little, we like sound bites, but will you come wrestle in the Word of God to understand this in your own life? A lot of new believers in this congregation, and I praise God for them. And so if you'll work with me this morning, uh, get what you can from what I'm about to say. And at the end, I'm going to give you a simple summary of what this means. Uh, But I'm going to go over eight points that we're going to try to understand. And so let's take a look at it. So my first point is uh, we are under obligation to to the flesh no longer, but to the Spirit. And we learned that in Romans 8, 5. <clears throat> as willful and as free as we obeyed our flesh when we were unbelievers. It was the most natural thing that you ever did was sin. Uh, the desire and freedom now to obey the Spirit as a child of God. So I, I want us to catch that. We, we owe the Spirit our allegiance. We owe Him our following. We're to be led by Him. We're to be filled by Him and controlled by Him. So we desire to walk with him. And what does it mean to walk with the Spirit? To be in agreement. Adam and Eve, Adam and God walked in the garden. They were in full agreement. They wanted the same things. They desired it. So to, to walk with the Spirit is I'm, I'm in connection with what he wants, where he's leading me, what this is all about. So if you walk with the Spirit, you're, you're in agreement with the things of God and what he's doing. You're going the same direction. To be, to be pleasing to God in all that we do. Every believer should be sitting here saying, I want to Please God in every area of my life. The law is written within my heart by the Spirit. And so it just starts with who am I trying to please? Am I trying to please my flesh or God? That's the question this morning. What is the the controlling thing of my life? I want to please God or all I want is to please my flesh and I want to just fill it, satisfy it, make it happy. I'm even trying to use church to satisfy my flesh. And so that's the question right out of the gate. It's huge and fundamental in our putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Who am I a debtor to? Who am I under obligation to? Has the gospel made me a debtor to God, to the Holy Spirit, to be led by Him and to live for Him? Or am I still a debtor to give my members and my body to sin and serve it the rest of my days? That's going to be the leading of the Spirit. Which am I? Second point. Whatever the Spirit does... It causes us to put to death the deeds of the flesh in our context in verse 13. <clears throat> so it, it causes us, the Spirit will cause us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. However, the Spirit works. So by the Spirit, it will cause me to will and to work for His good pleasure. It will give us victory against the deeds of the flesh and all of their solicitations, their desires. The Spirit will take these desires and begin to cut off the bloodline, the the lifeline of those wrong desires in our lives and in our thoughts. And so the Spirit will start getting to those roots and those those desires and wrong thoughts and idols. He's going to start coming and pouring weed killer on them. He will do something that will cause us to kill the desires within, not just the actions, but the desires and the wrong thoughts. He's going to come and start killing that. So somehow... The Spirit is empowering us to kill these desires that we've been learning about in Romans 6 and 7 that our our flesh and strength cannot kill. So this is a supernatural empowering to do what God has called us to do to mortify this sin. So the Spirit is the one who's going to empower us to do what's being commanded of us. Third, He makes your mind according to the Spirit. Remember back to Romans 8, 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Same thing in verse 13, the flesh and the Spirit. So the unbeliever sets their minds on the things of the flesh. That's all all you could be about. I, all I want is to make myself happy in this world. But those who are of the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit of God, eternal things, and our living, our living King and Jesus. Our minds are set on those things. So we are now spiritually minded. We understand the unseen. God has opened our eyes, and we get what this whole world now is about. We understand God and His program, and what He's doing in this world, what He has done, and what He will do, 
I, I just can't get over it. I walk around this world with my eyes open and I'm watching people lap up this world like a dog drinking water and just, I can't get enough. I can't get enough and my eyes are just open and I, I just walk through going, thank you God that my hope is not this anymore. I get what this is all about. We're, we're now, we get the unseen and we understand the spiritual realm or according to the spirit. So the way we put to death the deeds of the flesh, you got to be spiritually minded. You can't be living for the scene. It's, it's, it's not, the scene is not our hope and goal and desire anymore. God set you free from that. And so to, to, if you're ever going to put the death, the deeds of the flesh, it's got to be the spiritual mindedness that now that's not what I live for. If I still am according to this world and the flesh, you can't put to death the deeds of the flesh. They, they, they won't die because that's what you love and that's what you want. So quite simply, our remaining flesh wants to set our mind on the things of the flesh and not the things of the Spirit of God. Galatians 5 says that's our battle. So it's not our mind over matter, but having our mind on what matters. This is our calling to fix our minds in heaven where Christ is seated. This is how we're going to put to death the deeds of the body is we have the mind of Christ now. If we were still minded on the flesh, we would be debtors to it. And we would serve its every wine and its every whim. We would just keep, okay, I'll do it. I'll give it. I'll, I'll use my tongue for that. I'll use my eyes for that. We want the here and now. Like this whole world system is built on that. Everything in the world, you ever notice that? Nothing in this world says wait except investing so you can spend more on yourself later. And so it's just here, indulge, have it now. You deserve a break today. And we all once lived in that, Ephesians says. We walked according to that prince of power and that thinking. But the spirit-minded one is looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. Your hope is eternal life. Your hope is God. You've been made alive to that. You, this world is not your hope any longer. And so that's being spiritually minded. I'm settled. I don't have to get everything now. And I know that it will never make me happy now if it's against the Spirit. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. So I'm just eternally minded. And I'm looking for my home, my true city. And I'm moving toward that. And that's what I'm, I'm living for. And I, I, I think American Christianity has lost its hope of what we really have been saved for. We've been saved for an easier life here I've been saved for eternal life with him. That's big. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 14, Paul says these things we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So the way we are spiritually minded is through the Word of God. The Spirit gave us the Word of God, and it's the eternal things, and it's the truth. So if I want to think eternal, I want to think spiritually of the Spirit, I'm thinking through the Word of God. That is now working. We labor to know it, and here's the part we're going to look at this morning, is the Spirit teaches us the Word of God. And I know more people who learn the Word of God, and the Spirit does not teach them. And we need to understand what that means, because one will not kill sin, and one will. And so we need to know what that means in our fourth point. How does the Spirit bring this word then to us in such a way that it puts to death the deeds of the body? That was my question all week. Simply put, how does this help me with sin? How does this help me with my desires and addictions and emotions and struggles? How does the Spirit use His word to help me put to death the deeds of my body? And that's what I'm after Pastor, uh, two years of Romans and you're finally telling me what I wanted two years ago. Come on, man. How do I put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit? And I want you to flip over to Galatians 3. This is an important verse. How does the Spirit use the Word to put to death the deeds of our body? And in Galatians 3, 5... Paul asks a really powerful question. <clears throat> Does he then, God, who provides you with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and works miracles among you like saving you and changing you into the image of Christ, does he do it by the works of the law 
or by hearing with faith. And so there's a way to triumph over sin in a way that it's the Holy Spirit doing it. And the question is simply put this way. Do you do it by the works of the law or do you do it by hearing with faith? So do I kill sin by my own flesh, just working hard and trying to get rid of it and turning my eyes and fight? You know, do I, do I put sin to death that way or do I put sin to death by hearing the word of God and believing it? That's Paul's question. That's kind of a simple question. He's saying, how are you saved? And we've spent two years on this. Were you saved by the works of the law, by being a good person and religious and cleaning yourself up? Or were you saved by hearing the gospel and believing it? And we've learned it's by hearing this gospel and believing it that you were justified and made right with God. And so the simple question here is, how are you going to grow now? How are you going to put to death the deeds of the flesh, brothers and sisters? By the works of the law, which is 99% of the way it's done, or by hearing with faith? And the answer is pretty simple. It, it is hearing with faith. So the way the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the flesh is by hearing the Word of God and believing it. What? Does that sound like the theme of Romans? What is the theme of it? The obedience of faith. I'm writing these things to bring about the obedience of faith. The, the obedience that springs out of believing this gospel, holding it and treasuring it, produces an obedience that law never could. And so here it is. It comes by faith. It comes from hearing and hearing the word of God in Romans 10. I obey what I believe. And I choose based on what I believe. That's why doctrine is so important. Indwelling sin says, let me make you happy. The end of the, the devil, Adam and Eve, you're going to be like God if you eat of this apple. And there's some sin right now in your life saying, if you do this, it's going to make you happy. It's going to satisfy you. That's, am I going to believe that? Or am I going to believe what God has said? And he said that righteousness and walking in my paths and seeking me is where fullness of joy is found. What am I going to believe when these solicitations come? My flesh that's lying to me and saying, this will make you happy. And every one of you who are believers say, it has never made me happy for more than 10 minutes. What is my problem with remaining sin? Why does it win so often in my life? Because I don't believe. I believe that helped my unbelief. This is the call of the Christian life to hear the gospel, to hear God's word and believe. What did he say right out of the gate in Romans 1.17? The just shall live by faith. The justified ones are going to be those who live by faith, believing the word of God. The spirit uses the truth so that you're minded on the spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh so that we have obedience and we keep the requirement of the law to love God and love others. We're to believe it. What did Paul say? You're to fight the good fight of faith. Fight to rest in Christ alone. Fight. And we're going to look at that next week, what that all means. But we do everything we can to learn the word of God and to believe it and to rest in it. And that sounds so simple. But the devil is so happy if you just learn it and stop and feel like that's the end goal of the Christian life. And unfortunately, I've done it in my own heart and I've shepherded it many times. That isn't where it stops. Everything you're struggling with this morning with sin is because you don't believe fully what God has said in his word. Every sin that you're battling, is I just won't believe God and take him at his word and rest in it and believe it. That sounds crazy. But every sin I struggle with or being tempted by, I ask myself, what am I not believing right now? When we do believe God's word, it subdues the temptations and the solicitations from the flesh to make other things bigger than loving God and loving other people. And that's what it is. Every sin is either against God or humans. And it's tempting you to think that way. I discipline myself in the means of grace next week to know his word. 
spiritually minded. And I know you get tired of this quote, but the businesswoman's five-minute devotional is never going to do it. This is going to take a battle and a fight. And we get in this word and we read it and we seek to know it and understand it and believe it. I never read the word of God without praying, God, let me get this. Let, let, how does this work out? Let me live it. Let me believe it. It's never, I did my little five-minute thing, a scripture day keeps the devil away. Now I can go to work. I have to believe it and lean on it and trust it. Well, I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. That's why you're battling this morning, brethren. The sin that so easily entangles us is unbelief. Every sin is unbelief. And remaining sin, the deeds of the body, are solicitations to one who does not believe the promises of God and the gospel. They're promising you something contrary to God every time. And, and, and to get you hooked up to lesser things, to the seen and to temporal pleasures, and not to believe that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what temptation wants to lead you away from, and the Spirit wants to lead you to it. So let me show you this and prove it. I want you to come to God's Word with me and, and see and believe. Fifth point, how's this happen? The Spirit speaks adoption to our hearts in this battle. <clears throat> I was just thinking about orphans, and one thing I've learned in my journey with orphans is you have to claw and scratch for everything because no one else will take care of them. Many times they live in fear, and they live for the moment because they don't know where their next meal is coming from, and there's hangover from that. And I want you to listen to this, because this is no small thing. This is big. This call to mortify sin is sandwiched right between two statements that I think are so crucial to its fulfillment that I don't want you to miss it. So look at me in verse 12. So then... Brethren, Jesus is my brother, the father, I'm his child, I'm his son or daughter here this morning. This is written, put, put to death, brethren, those who have been adopted by God and brought into the family of God, accepted and loved. As I go to fight sin, I am a, a, in the family of God. Look at Romans 8, 14, right after the command. And it's with a four explanation. It's not a new sentence. Put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, oh my. I'm a child of God. This gospel has brought me into adoption. Jesus, teach me how to pray. Our Father. It's one of the greatest things I possess now. And all that that entails is the foundation of my hope and trust. I don't have to take things into my own hands when sin calls me to do it. When doubt rolls in. When self-care and protection and provision are coming in. I'm cared for by God Almighty who is my daddy. That's going to take care of a lot of solicitations. To, to believe the adoption Abba, I, I, I'm convinced that we don't understand that to the degree that we need to. These temptations to sin are usually grounded in something that will make us more happy or more secure than what we have in God. Adam and Eve, the perfect example. And, and the, the fight is I have everything in this gospel. I'm a child of God. I've been adopted into the family. This belief would mortify a hundred sins plaguing you this morning. It could put to death fear. How do you fear being a son of God or a daughter of God? Doubt. Is he really for me? Is he really going to help me? Needing someone else's approval when you already have God's? Seeking a relationship here on earth that's finally going to make me happy? when I already have the only relationship that can ever make me happy. This is it right here, guys. I, you get adoption. And that's how the Spirit is going to help you put to death the deeds of the flesh that are, all these temptations are, are for orphans. 
They're for people who aren't in the family of God. And he's going to use that so mightily in putting to death the roots of the solicitations of sin. Six, we are those then who are led by the Spirit. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So now the Spirit within us, He leads us. He leads us into God. He leads us into spiritual things. He leads us into the highway of holiness. He leads us into the paths of righteousness. And so the way I'm going to put to death the deeds of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit's leading me. And He's leading me not to sin. He's leading me away from it. And so as these temptations and all of them are coming, the Spirit is leading me to God, to the gospel, to the eternal things, to all that I have in Christ Jesus. The Spirit is leading me and keeping me anchored and focused on the things that really matter, the eternal spiritual things. And so we are led by the Spirit of God. Number seven in verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And so here it is, he assures us. Why would that be so important? So that I can believe every promise he's ever made to me as his child. I know I'm a child of God and I can bank on these. And if I don't, I can't rest on these things and I will doubt him. I'll treat God like a used car salesman. I'll doubt everything he says. If you're a used car salesman this morning, I apologize. (laughs) There are some godly ones and there's godly lawyers here and godly uh, accountants and the just list goes on. So this is key. This is not just other people's bread. It's mine. It's my bread. My promises. My father. My hope. I'm a blood-bought child of God and the spirit has testified with my spirit that I'm a child of God. And what that would do in our fight against sin and putting it to death. Sin gets nowhere when the one being tempted knows I am his and he is mine. I saw it with Jesus in the garden, everything the enemy tempted him with. And if God's not going to help you, why don't you turn this stone into bread? And he just, you couldn't get him away from trusting the father. He knew he was, he was the son and he knew he could rest. And every temptation was to get him to doubt the father, doubt his plan, his program, his provision, every temptation and the cure, the word of God believing it, I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God and he's going to take care of me. This will put to death the deeds of the flesh. What this would do for our fight against sin, sin gets nowhere if we would understand that. So now number eight, how does the Spirit assure us and cause us then to believe these promises? I want you to go back to Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin and the flesh. The law could have never done this. The law could never take away my condemnation for my sin and not just take away the condemnation, but now fill me with the love of the Father. So he doesn't just want to condemn me now. Jesus removed that on the cross, but now he loves me. (laughs) It's not just he won't condemn me. You got to go to the next step. He loves me like his own child. I stand in grace. I now have peace with God because of what Jesus did on the cross. There is right now this morning no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is just never going to be any white hot condemnation on me ever again. I can never come back into that sphere, no matter what I do. And what would that do for you this morning if you just believed that? I don't mean just nod to it. I mean that you, not just, I understand doctrinally, I, I can go through the whole atonement, but that you get it. And this is, I love what it says, that the Holy Spirit teaches us. And so we get it, and the Holy Spirit teaches it to where we believe it, and we rest in it, and we build our lives on it. And so this is the key to it all. If I get that the King loves me right now this morning because of Christ, nothing with you. Who cares what my boss says about me? Who cares what my friends say behind my back? Who cares what my own family 
says about me, and they say much. Jordan's back in town, and I, I've heard a lot, man. The reality is that because of flesh tempting me, this is sad. There are times where I care, what, I care more what other people think. Maybe you're sitting here, just a single girl, you're just lost, and what does that boy think about me? And so I know this with my head, but I need to get it in my heart because it doesn't set you free just in your head. You're still trying to get acceptance and get everybody to like you if you just get this in your head. It won't set you free. And so what you need is mortification of that sin by the Spirit. We need our mind on the Spirit. The Word is bigger than just mind. You remember when we studied it two weeks ago? When it said mind, it's not just your thinking, but it was your whole heart. It was your, your being. What, what captures you? What takes you up? That, that, that's what we're looking at. And so the beauty of the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John 14 through 16, it's better that I go away. And the Holy Spirit, I will send him and he will make known to you all that I taught. I'm gonna, he's going to take the word of Christ and he's going to make them real to you. He's going to bring them into your heart where all of a sudden you get it and you see it and you believe it and you live a life of trust on these promises to show you the beauty of Christ. He has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The Spirit now makes Christ beautiful, lovely. The answer, it's not just this academic nodding your head to. We have to get where what he says about you, God, becomes more real than what your boss or husbands or friends say about you. I got to get to that place if I'm ever going to heal. And so this is my boots on the ground battle because their love is far more real to you this morning than God's. And the Spirit says, I want you to be taught by me to believe in Romans 8.1 that right now as I sit here this morning, there's no condemnation on me because Jesus was condemned in my place. He wants that to get into here to where it changes everything about you. I'm so changed. I have no condemnation on me. I believe it. I trust it. I live into it. And he wants me to believe that nothing can separate me from his love. He doesn't want me to just have that in my being. He wants me to live. When, when, when you know like a, a spouse loves you, man, it, it just sets you free. <laughs> if you get that there's nothing that can set you free from the love of God in Christ Jesus into your heart, it's going to change and transform everything. And when these temptations come, those two anchors, believed, are going to set you free from what you're being tempted and asked to do. This is the only way to put to death the desires of the flesh. Remember we said they're epithumias. Thumias are desires, epis over desires. And so our flesh has these desires that we want things more than God. And the only way is with a greater desire and a greater delight. And that's the spirit. And the Spirit comes inside of us and He leads us to this as we read the Word of God and believe it. And He leads us to say, that's greater, that's better, that's sweeter than anything this is being offered to you in this crazy world. I'm believing what my flesh says because I'm not filled with the Spirit and the teaching of the Word of God so that I get it and it gives me victories over my temptations. This morning, I believe Romans 8.3 that he was condemned in my place and I have no more condemnation. One preacher I heard this week, he said, sin is the cancerous tumor of self-centeredness and it wants to kill you. And so you must kill it or it will kill you. And radiation is to slowly shrink that tumor and kill it. And the radiation is what Christ did on the cross illuminated by the Holy Spirit. The way I'm going to kill this it's by believing the gospel in my heart. And that, that's what starts healing and bringing wholeness to souls and walking as Jesus walked on this earth. I've been watching my dear brother and sister Ray and his wife Sammy, and I've known them for over 30 years. And just them laboring in the word of God for these 30 years, I've just watched them give themselves to the means of grace. They gave themselves to the bride of Christ. 
And they have learned the promises and truths through many trials and many blessings. And they believe it. They believe these promises as she's sitting there with chemo dripping in her veins, telling everybody the glories of the gospel with joy all over her face. How do you do that? Because you believe what this word says. And all the temptations being thrown at them, they're fighting the fight of faith. And they're putting God on display and the reward will be eternal life. I want you to see what this does when you get it. The joy of being your pastor is I get to see this all week long. I had a brother this week I met with in two-year depression. And he went and he fought the fight of faith. And as he wrestled and fought and quit believing what his flesh was telling him in the world, uh, he's finding the victory now. And God's preparing a man to stand in power now against the devil and his schemes. I talked with a lady this week who watched Fox News way too much, which is 10 minutes. (laughs) And she said, all it produced in me was anxiety. And it, it just made me anxious about everything and what's going on and all the schemes and plans and how bad our government is and where it's broken. And, and I finally just turned it off. And now I just get in my Bible and I read it and I'm seeking the face of Christ And literally, she says, there's not even a hint of fear about the future in this country. It's been mortified. So it isn't just, just maybe this will help. It's dead. Literally, this fear that was owning this woman is dead. By the Spirit of God taking His Word and illuminating her hope and her joy and what God has done in Christ. And it's just gone. I'm not afraid of anything. I watched her wheeled into surgery, brain surgery, just smiling, say, if I live or die, I'm Christ. That's what this gospel does. And hearts. I remember I had a season in my life where I was losing my house with five young kids and I was walking into the auction house to see who was going to get it and just reading Matthew 6 and it overwhelmed me that Jesus cares, that, that word I love so much, much more. He cares so much more about me than birds and much more about me than lilies and all of a sudden it just overtook me the, the confidence and rest and trust of the provision of God. And so what I'm getting at is as we get this word and God gets it in our hearts and we believe it and trust on it, we're we're gonna be putting death. I was so anxious and that just came and just killed it. Boom, believing it and letting it get into your heart and through your whole life, God's gonna do that and journey you to bring you to these places where I, I believe this and I rest in it and I trust it. I asked some of you to send your sins to me. (laughs) Some of you were so sweet to do that. I really appreciated it. Um, And because of time, I think I'm going to kick them over to next week. Sorry, I'll do a couple of them. Say you're struggling with forgiveness. I just listened to this series by Milton Vincent, who I went to seminary with, just a dear brother. And he's talking about how to forgive by doing this journey around the cross. And as you journey around the cross and look at all these different aspects of, of, of what Christ is doing there for your sins, how suddenly it just releases them. And all that journey is, is looking at this word and believing it. And when you begin to believe what Jesus did for your sins on that cross, you won't shake a brother by his neck and say, pay me my lesser debt. It's going to release you. And if you're sitting here stuck in unforgiveness, it's, it's journeying around the cross in this word and believing what it says. And as I believe it, that sin is mortified. Just boom. The sin of anger. What I've learned in my journey, the sin of anger is usually an epithumia. It's usually an over-desire. You know, James says, why do you guys fight and quarrel? Is it not your epithumias? Because in a marriage, you're, you're fighting because I want it this way. I want him to do that or her to do that. And anger is, there's something I really want that I'm not getting, or someone's threatening it, or I'm scared it's going to go away. So the, the anger's coming from something that means way too much to you. And what's the cure? Something that means way too much to me. God, and what he's done in Christ, and believing it. And as I believe that, it just puts to death these epithemias that are causing the anger And then I'll do one more. Self-pity, I think, is ruling our land. It's just very subtle and dangerous, and it's 
God, uh, he's not taking care of me. He's, it's not working out the way I wanted. My kids aren't what I thought. My marriage isn't, my church isn't, and uh, my country certainly isn't. And there's just a lot of people running around in self-pity. And it's very subtle because anger is very easy to spot, but self-pity can look very humble. And so self-pity is, God got it wrong. Um, Faith is, I I deserved hell. I deserved condemnation and Jesus took it for me. I, I deserve nothing else and nothing more. God has given me everything for life and godliness. And and when I believe these things, it's hard for me to feel sorry for me. I have everything in Christ Jesus. And so the only way I've learned to quit feeling sorry for myself is, is the gospel. And when you realize what you have in Christ, not just up here, but in here, I have everything. I'm not going to walk around like Eeyore. I don't, I'm not going to spend all my days feeling sorry for myself. I'm going to just spend my days thanking God for what he's given me in Christ. And then you, if you'll look, the rest of Romans 8, I don't have time, but at the end of the chapter, he's going to, you know, it, it, who, if God's for me, who could be against me? And he's going to go into this whole list of how we now fight and mortify sin by faith. And so we're going to keep learning this and journeying it, but that's enough for this morning. Amen? So I want you to see how to put to death the deeds of the body. It's an all-out war. And so your responsibility is to starve it, avoid it, flee, deny it, resist it. And next week, you're to get into the means of grace to strengthen faith, to not serve my flesh, to serve God led by the Spirit, to walk with Him, to believe the promises and truths of God's Word and the Spirit, to teach them to me so that I know they're mine and sin will be put to death. It cuts the lifeline by hearing and believing the Word of God. And by the Spirit, we can put to death that which is seeking to put us to death. By the Spirit, we will win the message of chapter 8 as he says he will bring all his sons to glory. The victory is sure. Don't you like going into a battle where you know you're going to win? I've never been in one of those, but it feels good spiritually. But far too many are trying to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the works of the law. And I want you to repent of that this morning. And I want you to fight the good fight of faith. And I want you to fight to rest in Christ alone through his word by his spirit. Believing the truths that are ours by the work of Christ. And I got to get in the secret place and ask the spirit to do that work in my mind and heart through his word. And then come join and lock hands with me and help me to believe the magnificent and wonderful promises of God that are yea and amen in Christ. It is the power to put the deeds of the flesh in the mortuary. And so let's pray, saints of God, may the smell in this place be of dead sin and then the aroma of the sweet Christ uh, in our church. So let's pray. And we will thank the Lord for our time in his word. Father, thank you. Thank you that You've given us a command that can be done by the Spirit. And I thank you it's not done by the works of the law. God, help us to learn how to do this by the Spirit, by hearing and believing. And Lord, there's so many truths we've seen in Romans. And if we just believed them, sin would never win again. God, sin's power is unbelief. And it tempts and it persuades and tries to get us to bite baits. God, I pray that our minds and our hearts would be so spiritual and so set on the things of God where Christ is seated. I pray that we would walk in the Spirit and journey in these things, God, and that that we would believe these promises and you would put to death these remaining sins that are lying to us on a daily basis. God, we thank you for such a power that we have indwelling sins, so you sent your Spirit to indwell us. We have the victory and we have the Spirit of God and we look forward to that day when this battle will end. What will it be like to never have to battle sin for all of eternity? God, thank you for that blessed hope. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we all pray. Amen.